Let's begin now, Professor Paul Rogers, who is, of course, Professor of Peace Studies at Bradford University. It's great to have you, Paul. How are you doing? Hello. Good to be back. Great to see you. Okay, firstly, this war originally, I mean, they didn't say this was their intention, but I think it's legitimate and reasonable to say that they wanted a lightning strike on Kiev and to take down the government and install a puppet government. I think that was their war aim, wasn't it? And now what they've done is they've refocused on the east, the Donbass region. Um, why has this war gone on for so long when Russia is obviously a much bigger and has a much supposedly bigger and more sophisticated military than that of Ukraine? What has happened? I think that there are several different reasons in many ways. Um, one is that from at the start, uh, I agree with you fully that what Putin and the Kremlin were expecting was to be able to basically take Kiev probably within the first 36 hours or so uh, to, well, basically remove the Ukraine government, the elected government, and replace it with a regime which many people would see as a puppet regime. At that time, they also wanted to do two other things, very importantly. One was to take uh, air supremacy, control of the airspace within Ukraine, total control, because that would get, make it much easier for them to move around on the ground. And thirdly, they clearly wanted to extend uh, the influence and impart the control that they had in Crimea through to the Donetsk region, which is basically the eastern part of Ukraine, including two areas that have basically declared themselves as independent and have been recognized by Russia just before the start of the war. So that was what they wanted. It went wrong right from the start. They failed on Kyiv. The In many ways, the Ukrainians were ready for the initial air assault. And as a result, within sort of 36 hours, it was clear that things weren't going quite right. And if that started on the Thursday, remember it was on the Sunday that you had a clearly frustrated, angry Putin uh, saying NATO keep out of this because otherwise we risk an escalation to something worse. In other words, he was threatening some sort of nuclear retaliation at that time. Now, that, of course, has not come. Uh, but what has developed since, I absolutely agree with you, is that Russia has tended to concentrate on the south and east. It's actually withdrawn its troops. It did it about four weeks ago uh, from a very substantial area in the north, including all the way around Kyiv. Um, that has basically given rise to much more evidence about the crimes, the atrocities, the war crimes and the rest that have been going on. So now I think what Russia is doing, or the Kremlin is doing, must always use that term because it does not represent all Russians by a very long shot, either abroad or within Russia. But the point is that what Putin and the Kremlin are now doing is trying to consolidate the degree of rather limited progress they've had in the East and to some extent in the South. But even there, it's proved problematic because essentially, why has it gone wrong for them? Well, essentially, I think there are probably three different reasons. One is the Ukrainians obviously have proved to be far more determined to resist, uh, both at a societal level and at a military level as well, far more than the Russians expected. And this is a huge miscalculation on the side of the Putin people. They expect it to be something of a walkover. And what they expected was to take control of Ukraine like the huge influence they have in Belarusia, and the two together would effectively extend uh, Kremlin influence several hundred kilometers to the west, much more fully onto the border with NATO, although obviously Belarusia, a much smaller country in population, already has a border with NATO. So that was what they wanted. That is not what, what they've got. And the consolidation, I think, is back to the east and also to the south. But there are other reasons as well. One was that essentially the Russian armed forces proved far less effective and efficient than people expected. Um, we could talk about this a lot, but the, the bottom line is that they were nothing like as good as the Russians expected uh, or even the Western analysts expected, because most Western analysts on the official line in the United States and in Britain and NATO expected the Ukrainians to lose within at most two to three weeks and possibly even less than that. But then the final issue, I think, is in many ways the, the question of what is happening within Russia. Because, of course, although we're seeing a lot of the effect of the sanctions and the rest, what we're perhaps not seeing is the high level of casualties that are being experienced by the Russian army. And these have been quite extraordinary. I mean, it's probably reasonably accurate, taking aside all the um, exaggerations on both sides, uh, that the Russian army, primarily the army, and inclusive navy on the ship, the, the Moskva, 
uh, they've probably lost about 15,000 young men killed. And that means in the type of war that's going on, at least 30,000 so badly injured that they're out of combat, maybe for a long time, some, many of them maim for life. Now that is a huge total. I mean, the 15,000 they've lost in, what is it, about nine weeks is about similar, it's even more than the Russian losses in 10 years of the war in Afghanistan. So that gives you some idea of that. And it's one of the big unknowns about whether that ultimately will actually have an impact on the ability of the Kremlin to wage war. We're not seeing that yet, but we certainly saw that uh, earlier on in some ways. But I think the other thing that we perhaps I missed out in, in that catalog was the amount of support that had come from NATO at a very early stage. And essentially that is now huge. It's reckoned about 10 very heavily laden large military transport aircraft are flying into bases in Romania and Poland and probably one or two of the other states neighboring Russia, uh, bringing all kinds of armaments and they're getting increasingly modern and increasingly, if you like, offensive ones that can go over a long range. So that's the really problem from Putin's point of view. He's also achieved a degree of unity in NATO, which wasn't expected, and a degree of unity in the EU. So overall, he is in a difficult position, but from his own perspective, not least ideology, he is absolutely determined to continue. And this is where you get the likes of Sergei Lavrov basically threatening the risk, just the risk of escalation to something far worse, which means we are in an era, I would categorize it as essentially um, violent stalemate or unstable stalemate. It is becoming increasingly not just a state on state, but also a proxy war. And there's no easy end in sight. And the problem is of a risk of escalation at some stage. I think probably we're probably the, in the most dangerous stage, stage in the war, although it doesn't seem like that now, uh, any time in the last two or so months, I'm afraid. I mean, before I come, just ask you a bit further about that. It's kind of an alarming, alarming final sentence, I have to say. They've they've obviously now reconsolidated their forces um, in the east in Donbass, um, which I mean I suppose is the justification they they the rationale they tried to provide for the war, which was there's a large ethnic Russian population in that country. Though by no means even before the Russian invasion did that mean they were necessarily pro Kremlin, for example, um, but that they were being oppressed by the Kiev government. But it, it doesn't look like it's going well for Russia there either, even though they've, recon they've consolidated their forces in that particular area, which is obviously a less ambitious um, mission than that they originally planned. But the progress is pretty poor there, isn't it, by the looks of things? Or is that wrong? It is. But then again, I think there are one or two things to bring in here. Um, you know, we, we hear on the, the media about, you know, Russia having 190,000 people in Ukraine. True to an extent, but in fact, the, what you might call the military uh, controlled by Russia, probably down to about 140, 145,000. Now, if you've lost 15,000 of those and another 30,000 quotes off the battlefield, that is a huge proportion. And many of the early groups that were actually involved in the fighting right at the start um, took huge losses. And they are having to be restructured. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right, Owen, that they're bringing more forces into the east. But many of those are where one of their sort of tactical um, regiment groups or, or battalion groups would have to be actually mixed up with another one to produce something which is at the right strength. Now, the effect on morale of young Russians in the armed forces is considerable. So to put it bluntly, I hate to use these terms in a war context, but bluntly, what you might call the perceived quality of the people in these units is low in purely fighting terms. I hate using this terminology. I'm coming from a peace studies department, it doesn't really make very much sense, but that's the reality. And essentially the troops that they have in the East uh, are mostly people who've experienced many problems already. Now, fair enough, they brought them all under one general who actually had a lot of experience in Syria, which may change things. They're trying to constrain their supply lines and the rest. And the Ukrainians have suffered pretty severe losses as well. But the reality is, um, as things stand at the moment, uh, the Russians are not in a position to even achieve the lesser aims that they've now actually adopted. Now, there are many other things they can do. They do have supplies of crews and middle range ballistic missiles. So they can send sort of, they can do occasional attacks on say, arm centers near Kyiv, uh, 
or Mary, not so much Mary Paul, or Odessa and the rest as they've done. Uh, but these are not substantial attacks in terms of taking territory. They are, if you like, more scare tactics. But meanwhile, on the other side, as, as we've seen, uh, many people within NATO, and I have to say primarily politicians and senior civil servants rather than military, are frankly upping the ante. And they're now talking about complete defeat for Russia. Now, the one thing you'd be absolutely sure of, you cannot completely defeat Russia in these circumstances because it is one of the two most advanced uh, worldwide nuclear powers. And we have to face up to that, which is what produces a huge difficulty in trying to chart a way towards some kind of settlement, I'm afraid. Is this now a proxy war between the West and Russia in Ukraine? Increasingly. I mean, essentially, um, if, you're, if you're trying to characterize wars uh, of the modern era, you get some which are state on state, purely and simply. You would say that would be true of the, the Falklands Mount Venus conflict 40 years ago. Others are much more proxy wars. Uh, and there have been many examples of those in recent years where the proxies have basically been aided hugely, bluntly, either by the West or by the East in the old Cold War days, and in more of the more complicated ways since. Now we actually have a mixture of the two. But the slide over the last nine weeks has been away from state on state with support from abroad to more and more of a proxy war as well. It's still increasing. It's still primarily Ukraine against Russia. And I mean, there have been some pretty uh, cynical comments that, in fact, NATO will fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian. Now, that may be pushing it a long way. But in a sense, um, Ukraine is becoming a vehicle. And if you take the really hawkish elements in the West, and then by no means dominant, but they are there, uh, what you actually see is they see this as the opportunity to cripple Russia for a long time. And those who see the axis of the world turning into either the West or China come Russia, they actually see this doubly advantageous because it will be more embarrassing to the Chinese. Now, that element is not dominant in the West, although I think some politicians, not least in Britain, are seeing it more and more that way. You can say it's absolutely understandable because we must never forget in all of this, the appalling behavior time and time again of the Russian troops. And I mean, the other big question is, why isn't the world commend condemnation from ordinary people even stronger than it is? We can perhaps get onto that. But the reality here is that this is to a large extent a proxy war and in that respect, I think it is becoming rather more dangerous. I mean, on that, well, firstly, actually, there's a comment uh, from Tad Campwell. What does Paul Rogers think of, is it Gerasimov? Gerasimov. Uh, yeah. Being sent to change the tactics on the Eastern Front. So that, and and then that other point you just made about, you know, I suppose for those of us like myself who would regard themselves as ardent critics of Western power, I would still look at this unequivocally and say this is heinous Russian aggression. Um and Ukraine's fighting a war of self-defense against that. But the, the, in, in much of the global South, including many governments, have declared a position of neutrality. So I'm just interested in why you think that is, as well as, as I said, this point about Gerasimov. Well, Tadeus is quite right. I mean, when I mentioned that an, a single general is being put in charge, that is Gerasimov. And he is the person who had huge experience in Syria. Um, and a pretty forceful commander, because one of the problems in Ukraine throughout, from the Russian point of view, is basically multiple commands and, and competition within the commanding groups. And Gerasimov may well make a difference to an extent, uh, but that does not bode well for the future of the war, because he used particularly tough measures when he's in Ukraine. But coming back to your other point, Owen, if I may, this is a very big issue. Um, and uh, I'll probably be rather unpopular for saying some of the things that I say in response. Uh, the broad thing, of course, is that a number of countries, including major countries in the global south, have long had close relations with Russia. Uh, India, for example, uh, has a very close military relationship. Russia has been pretty assiduous in, in basically selling arms to a range of countries. And so that at least explains it in part. But it's a wider thing than that. Um, it's not that many people, probably most people across the global south, are not condemning Russia. They are. And you get very strong condemnation. But you also got a very strong um, mood of um, plague on both your houses, put it that way. Yes, what is happening in Ukraine is appalling. What the West is seeing on television almost 24-7, particularly in the early days, is the appalling consequences. I mean, we have seen 
uh, bodies in the streets. We, we've seen the level of destruction. We've heard what's been going on. And that has had a huge effect on the West, partly because it is within Europe, but also, I think, because it is a level of visualization of war on everyday mainstream television, but we haven't really seen before with this intensity. Now, if you take typical television viewers in, say, the Middle East, who are watching the Arabic version of Al Jazeera or Al, Al Arabiya or the many other channels, in fact, that is the kind of level of the experience of war which they saw in Iraq, in Afghanistan, the more recent war against ISIS and the rest. So they basically see, well, yes, this is terrible, but well, put it this way, I mean, when Fallujah was under siege by the US Marines, you know, I think it was November 2004, in response to many atrocities, essentially the city was cleared of the rebels. But in the process, I think every public building was destroyed or badly damaged, and every house was destroyed. Half of all the houses were destroyed or badly damaged. When it came to trying to get rid of ISIS in, in Mosul, the cost was almost the destruction of the old city of Mosul. And if you track through the accurate reporting, which you've got from some of the really good American foreign correspondents, you see incidents of direct reprisals and things like that. Now, I'm not in any way arguing that this has been at the intensity of what we've seen in Ukraine from many of the Russian military, but it has been there and it's been protracted. And remember in the war against ISIS, which basically was 2014-18, but still continues to this day, almost unreported in the West, except occasionally as in Mosul, you actually had, roughly speaking, 100,000 precision-guided bombs and munitions used. You had 30,000 targets hit. On an American estimates, you had at least 60,000 ISIS supporters killed. Now, independent groups like Air Wars actually include in that probably six or 7,000 civilians killed as well. Now, that's almost unreported in the West. There were no Western journalists there, of course. So in other words, from the rest of the world, the world looks rather different. And I think this goes a long way to explain it. It doesn't in any way condone what the Russians are doing. And many people in the global South are anti that as much as anything, but they just see the world in a perhaps slightly more nuanced way. And it's not all goodies and all baddies, I'm afraid. The point, Paul, about uh, nuclear escalation, how yeah. much of a threat is that? Because these are nuclear armed blocks, both of them. They both have nuclear weapons. We're hearing some, I mean, on the West, which is Russia has to be permanently hobbled, essentially. And the Russian state has not responded well to that. How serious do you think an escalation is, bearing in mind nuclear weapons are possessed by both blocs? Well, I'll betray a little bit about my age. I do remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was a student in London at that time. It was one of the things that actually made me really think about nuclear weapons and become pretty bitterly anti-nuclear, which I have been ever since. The point is that looking over a long-term period, I think the potential for an escalation here was already greater than the Abel Archer crisis back in November, um, October, November, uh, what was it, 2000 and, no, so 1990, I, I, old age, I've forgotten the date, yeah. I'll come back, it was basically, it's the same as green, 1983, autumn of 1983. That was a pretty dangerous one. This is already worse. It's not yet at the level of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but could quite easily become one. One has to be careful what one says on air because, you know, my, one can unnecessarily cause people real concern. But I'll try and sort of put a, an analytical mind on it. One thing to remember is that throughout the Cold War, both NATO and Russia and the Soviet Union, as it then was, had loads of nuclear weapons, including many battlefield nuclear weapons. NATO's policy at the time from, when was it, uh, 1968, I think, uh, MC-14-3, the communicator that came out, was to go for flexible response, which meant that if NATO was losing a conventional war against the Soviet Union, against the Soviet bloc, they would have recourse to tactical nuclear weapons early on in the day in the battlefield context. I remember getting this firsthand when I was in on a briefing in NATO back in the mid 1980s, speaking over coffee with a, a senior German civil servant in the nuclear planning group. And I asked him, well, what would NATO do then if they were faced with a sudden huge impact of the Russians, the Soviets crossing the border into West Germany? He said, well, one of the possibilities would be five low yield airburst nuclear weapons, 
causing very little damage or death, but showing the Russians that we meant business. And that was basically written into it. Now we assume whatever the propaganda from the Soviet Union, they thought exactly the same. Now it so happens, of course, that the NATO policy is still the modern policy, uh, technically, although NATO is so powerful con conventionally that nobody would think of that. But it is the policy, and there've been several cases with Britain, for example, British military or politicians warning of the possible use of nuclear weapons in both the first and second Iraq wars. And of course, we did actually uh, transport tactical nuclear weapons for the Falklands War, the Falklands Malvinas mm. War. So it's built in. The change recently in Russia is simply that in the 1990s, they all still have the nuclear weapons, but the conventional weapons were really becoming appallingly backward and mm. limited. And so what happened was an increasing Russian move towards a willingness to arrive, uh, basically, uh, it was built into their thinking to go to a small scale tactical nuclear use at an early stage. That's the circumstances we're in. Now, Russia is not being defeated in terms of Russia itself, but it's becoming more and more dangerous in terms of the rhetoric being used. So I think this is the one area where we really need caution. I'm afraid politicians who basically talk about getting the Russians completely out of uh, Ukraine, there is no other way forward. I think that's dangerous talk, and I wish they wouldn't say it. Just finally, partly because my Wi-Fi can see his play. Uh, David, I know this is way too early, but what happens after the war? Where do you or does the West only care comes to stopping Russia? What's your take on that in terms of what happens in terms of the long-term reconstruction of Ukraine? And those links out there is how long do you think this war? Because it's now been spoken about this could be years and years and years. I don't think it'll necessarily like. I mean, it is in a stalemate. But I think there are problems that Russia is experiencing, serious ones. We simply don't know whether the Chinese will bluntly pull the plug on at some stage because it's becoming more difficult for them. Uh, we simply don't know the impact of those casualties. Uh, and basically, to use a very crude term, the impact of the mothers who lost sons in Afghanistan was one of the things that brought that war to a very early end. Now, the losses are even higher in Russia Although the power base has very strong media control, I rather suspect that given weeks and maybe months more, that will basically be an element which may increase and may even increase affect Putin. Under those conditions, then diplomacy counts for huge amounts. And this is where you have to bring in the UN effectively. Then it may then be possible to get some sort of compromise. But that in a way, is uh, in response to David Bywater, Bowater's question, and that is what happens after that? Well, essentially, if, let's say, let's say, ideally, there was some sort of compromise in which tacitly, in spite of all they've experienced, the Ukrainians accept that they do lose Crimea, and that part of the territory in the east, in the wider Donetsk region, um, is not under Russian control, but it has a degree of quasi-independence, uh, and I think they would accept that provided they have sort of border control and Russia could then say, well, we've improved our position. If that was to happen, then I think, well, for a start, I do not think Na uh, Ukraine would even then be welcome in NATO. It would certainly get much closer cooperation with the uh, with the EU. And then the risk is that the West moves on. I think actually that is unlikely because the impact of this war on Western public thinking is such that that would be very difficult to do. Now, I had to be careful about that because, I mean, Britain has been so appalling in terms of the Ukrainian refugees compared with the Poland and Germany and the rest. I'm never quite sure. So bluntly, I think it would depend as far as British role is, depends very much which, go which party is in power in Britain. I think there might be some difference if it was a Labour government rather than a Conservative government. Although I sometimes wonder, given the state of the Labour Party, but that's a personal view. <laughs> yeah, one I can sympathise with. Paul, that, that was absolutely brilliant as ever. Again, always a tour de force from you. Really, really brilliant insights and bleak, depressing, but that's the material we've got, but nonetheless, full of realism. Um, so really, really, really appreciate your expertise and for putting up with mine collapsing wi-fi which i can see is not doing so well uh but honestly paul that was that was brilliant as ever really really appreciate well, thanks, for having, uh, thanks very much for having me i wish that one could speak a lot more positively there are many other things happening i remember you, you always remind you of one thing that is the world over most people live in conditions of tolerable peace most of the time <laughs>
uh, we always have to hold that back when you're dealing with this sort of issue. Yeah, and I can imagine, I suppose, for you, I remember <laughs> during the financial crash, well, every time Rob, Robert Pestle was complained, he only ever appeared when things were going very, very badly in the world. Uh, and I suppose it's similar with your live work, even though, of course, you're a professor of peace studies. Uh, yeah, but honestly, I, have uh, these, I have all these colleagues who work on mediation and peace building. So I'm the outlier in peace studies. We're not all like me, believe me. <laughs> well, I wish we had uh, more experts of your calibre, but nonetheless, it's been a huge endeavour. Take care, Paul, and speak to you soon. Thanks very much.